morning everybody dr jillard again one last time this is the last embryology lecture it is spring 2020 it is week 10 and we made it well we haven't quite made it through but and we're almost there so let's talk about forming the neural tube so this is the process of neurulation and yep let's talk about it so the overall process of forming the neural tube is called neurulation starts with the formation of a neural plate it ends with the closure of this tube that we're going to create and we have a cranial and caudal end of the tube and we need to seal those up once the cranial nerve cranial end seals first caudal end second once the caudal end is shut then the process of neurulation is complete and that doesn't happen until week four there's four stages of neurulation that we need to go through this is from Carlson there's a neural plate we need to form first uh, then we need to shape the neural plate into a key-like structure uh, and you know what I mean a key it doesn't look exactly like a key but it's going to look kind of like this and that's from my uh, overhead view and then we're going to roll this thing up we're going to fold this into a tube-like structure we're going to create lateral folds and then once we fold we're going to fold and fold and fold until we fold into a tube like structure and just before we make a tube like structure we're, we're going to release some super important cells called neural crest cells and they are going to do an awful lot of work uh, form an awful lot of structures from melanocytes um, but we'll see there's a big list coming of these which boards love what tissue what's the embryological derivative of tissue so we'll go over that in a bit so let's talk about step one is neurulation it's formation of the neural plate I should watch my time too let's see okay so about day 18 everything starts so day 18 is we're into the third week the primitive streak or the primitive node and the nodal cord are the main things and there's some other ave cells can help a little bit and that precordal plate will help a bit but mainly the primitive node and the nodal cord they are going to release proteins that soak into the cells above them into the ectoderm cells remember ectoderm cells they're um, they're epithelial tissue uh, so we need to convert that into a neural tissue so these chemicals are these growth factors and these other proteins they soak up and they cause the ectoderm cells above them to differentiate it starts in the cranial region first and the first thing that happens is the cells get really really thick and once they get thick they a new type of tissue is named and as they thicken you don't call them ectoderm cells anymore you can see that they've changed and that's when you call them neuroectoderm cells All right, here's a cartoon of notochord releasing various growth factors and other proteins and they've the ectoderm was blue up here and it's caused these cells to get quite thick and morph into a new cell type and so now we're going to call those neural ectoderm cells we're good with that it's hot up here again so i'm taking a little water all right, and this and this is kind of a head-on or cross-sectional view. Here's our trilaminar disc, mesoderm, endoderm, ectoderm, uh, with a notochord here. Primitive streak is starting to regress. Primitive streak would be be backwards. It would be back deep into the plane of the page, which we can't see anymore. Okay, so midline cranial ectoderm cells has have been induced. Uh, into neuroectoderm cells which in turn have formed what's called the neural plate so these 
cells are no longer ectoderm cells. They're called neuroectoderm cells, and they form a distinct structure, and that structure is called the neuroplate. So this, we had to convert these epithelial cells into a neural tissue, and that was called neural induction, or the neural induction process has started. Collectively, these new cells are called neuroectoderm cells, and they make up a structure called the neural plate. And this is considered the first step in the formation of the central nervous system. Cranial origine goes first. Here's a bird's eye view or an overhead view of our trilaminar disc. We can see ectoderm all around here. And we can see that a little plate has formed, and that's the neural plate. Underneath it, we can see the nodal cord. Here's the primitive streak. Remember, the primitive streak is going to start regressing and going backwards. As it goes backwards, it extends the nodal cord out. Okay. All right. So at first, that only develops above the nodal cord in the cranial region. Uh, develop specifically, if you want to, here's the question, where does the precordial, or what is the neural, where does the neural plate, what structures do the neural plate form between? Well, there's the primitive streak, but there's the primitive node of the primitive streak. And then up here we have the oropharyngeal membrane is probably best structure. Precordial plate is also right in there, that's the gray structure as well. So notice it's a very wide structure at first as well. But the new developing structure, as the, as the primitive streak regresses and the nodal cord elongates, we're going to form a more narrow structure, and that's going to give us that key-shaped structure. OK, there's another uh, view of it. Here we can see the ectoderm cells have been induced. Uh, yeah, pretty much we've already said. I think we need to go over that again. Who are the players involved in this neurulation? Uh, so we already kind of said who they are. It's the primitive node, uh, the nodal cord, precordal plate, and the AVE cells, the anterior visceral endoderm cells. They all have a hand in the process of neurulation. Right? When, when you see something like this, right, this is all teed up for me to make a question on. Sorry, a little cough. I hope I cut that out. Um, yeah, so teed up for me to make a question on, so this is a good, good slide to know. What's the trick to, how do you make a neuroectoderm? How do you take a, a regular ectoderm cell and convert it into a neuroectoderm cell? Well, it's, I don't want to say it's simple, but it's kind of simple. Uh, you just need to turn off the BMP4 gene and that's exactly what to do. The secret is to turn off bone morphogenetic protein 4 expression in the target endoderm cell. So those cells that are going to become neuroectoderm cells, you need to go flip off the switches, flip off the genes, and tell them to stop make, making BMP4. Without BMP4, the ectoderm morphs into its default state, which is a neural tissue. Right? All those other cells, all the cells of the ectoderm have expressed BMP4. So if you want to make neural tissue, you need to turn off. It's said to be neural tissue is said to be the default state of ectoderm. Primitive node. So what turns off BMP4? How do we do that? Uh, so pr the primitive node secretes two BMP inhibitors which help Make sure BMP4 is not on. Um, that's noggin and cordon. The nodal cord and the AVE cells, the anterior visceral endoderm, and the precordial plate, they also help the primitive node by secreting Cerebus 1, another BMP inhibitor. So with these three going, the chances are you're going to get your BMP shut off and you're going to turn them into a neuroectoderm cell. We also have a little business to do as well. The, remember, epithelial cells have E cadherin, uh, so we need to turn that off. 
that's the stuff that that holds the cells together. Those are the cams we've talked about. Uh, so that has to be turned on, and the gene that makes NK adherins needs to be turned on in their place. Remember your histology. EK adherins are found in epidermal tissue, and NK adherins they hold cells together in neural tissue. We won't go into that process though, which you'll be happy about. So what does it do? What's so we got a plate? How's that going to be a neural tube? What's the big deal about this plate anyway? Well, we have now just created, doesn't look like much, but we've created the primitive brain and primitive spinal cord. Uh, this neural plate is going to give rise to the brain and spinal cord, as we'll see. Also the retina. There's other structures. And then if you count the, um, well, we'll save that. I won't get into that. All right, so the next step we need to do, we need to stretch that structure out, right? That's got to be our spinal cord and brain. It's got to go all the way down the, the surface. It's got to go through the, at the axis of the, uh, of the trilaminar disc. So we need to stretch it. And so we need to grow it caudally. And that's the next step. So remember we had this up here. So we start growing it back this way. And I don't think I wrote this down, but uh, the uh, the primitive streak is shrinking underneath it as the primitive streak shrinks in this direction uh, the notochord grows remember we talked about that last time the notochord is growing so notochord is always able to secrete the BMP turner offers to help this occur All right so classically it's more tapered this new part here therefore it's, it's said to look like a key more key-shaped thing, this neural plate. It hasn't folded yet, though. Elongation. So the process of convergent extension is the process how it elongates. Uh, and this means that as the new tissue grows from the parent tissue, it does so in a, a more narrowed type manner. Uh, so what does that mean? That the cells that are are kind of induced or BMP is turned off in the neural um, cadherins start activating. Neural cadherins pull really tight together and uh, therefore you get uh, intercalation of these cells and it makes it come together. Okay, it just pulls them in together. Another concept is the plantar cell polarity pathway. I've taken a lot of slides out here. We don't have to get too crazy deep into this. You should be familiar with the term, though. Plantar cell polarity pathway, that controls the convergent extension. Uh, this relies on went, and a bunch of receptors have to be created as well. The fizzled, uh, the cell SR, and the vangle. A very, very complex pathway. This is way deeper than we need to know. So I'll cut it right there for that part. Uh, so here's what we have so far. Notice how the nodal cord and dots underneath it has grown as the primitive streak has shrunk. It still is, we still have our key shaped, although it's filling out a little bit here. Uh, and yeah, this is going to form the future brain, this bigger part up here. And this slend, more slender part will will form the future spinal cord. Um, and yeah, these are all made of neuroendocrine cells. What about the blue ones? What kind of cells are those? Those are still ectoderm cells, right? BMP, BMP4 is still turned on uh, in these in various degrees. Remember the uh, BMP4 is really high out here, but it's kind of a medium degree right here. So we're going to do something with that in a little bit. Lateral folding. Okay, so now it's time to do something with this plate. About day 18, and and before I go further, many explanations have been proposed for this. Uh, and they talk about, many authors talk about a single mechanism responsible for folding. Uh, but uh, Carlson points out that it's not a single mechanism. There's a lot of other new research coming out which is showing more mechanisms uh, to create this folding so it's a lot more complicated than most authors uh, give it give it credit for so there's no 
one mechanism really. Uh, the way I'm going to teach it though is how the board books say, and that's what you need uh, for your boards. But in reality, there's no single mechanism. It's a very complicated process. And we're not even going to talk about the gene molecular biology of this. So we'll keep it simple. So f the first thing that happens, we have a flat plate. So here's that cross-sectional view. First thing that happens is we get kind of a V-shape going on. This is the dorsal region up here. Uh, this is ventral region. We're kind of looking head-on or an axial view of this. So we're going to bend this thing. Uh, and to do that, these cells in this area, uh, they have to morph from a columnar type sh shape into a weird triangle shape. So you don't know any triangle shape. Well, these are your first triangle shape cells. So they'll have a narrow axis at the top, a wider one down at the base. Um, and yeah, that's what happens. Um, so here's much better than my drawing. Um, but here's the dorsal region up here. Here's the ventral region down here. And we have these nice triangle-shaped cells. And yeah, and if they're triangle in shape, it's going to bend the plate. And it bends downward into the mesoderm, kind of pushing down the nodal cord. Uh, that's the way it does. Okay. Um, so we talk about just one thing. We cut out a lot of stuff, but this is an easy one, shroom, to remember. So what causes the neural ectoderm cells in the midline to become triangular? Uh, it's a gene product gets turned on. It's released from the notochord just over the very midline, and that's called shroom. And it doesn't go out to the outer portions yet, but the shroom soaks in to those neuroplate cells right in the midline, and it causes the microfilaments of the cells of the cytoskeleton in the apical region to squeeze or contract together. Uh, if, as they contract together, it causes a triangle shape, right? Remember, cells have a cytoskeleton. Uh, these guys just get really crunched down, maybe thick, and these ones are, are still kind of hanging out in their normal direction. They haven't been affected. Uh, but that's kind of what creates the triangle shape there. So at this point, we have a, now a midline uh, with kind of walls folded up on each side of it. That first little uh, triangle, where's that picture? Uh, so this region right in here, um, that is going to get a new name because that's where the bending occurs. And that's going to be called the median hinge point. The median hinge point. Okay. Uh, the walls that stick up from the sides, now the plate's no longer flat, but it's got a dip in the middle. And the walls are called neural folds. And those are going to go from a wall-like structure into more of a curved-type structure. And the groove on the other side of the hinge point, that's called the neural groove. So here's our flat, pretty much flat neural plate going on. Uh, and then we have this hinge-like action. This is called the median hinge point. Uh, and then a neural groove is on the other side. And these are called neural folds, the walls of the, uh, the neural plate. Still kind of the neural plate. It's just a folded neural plate. Okay, the ectoderm is helping. So look at this. So as this is naturally starting to buckle downwards, we have the ectoderm has sensed that it's lost control. Uh, the ectoderm is supposed to be on the dorsal surface of the trilaminar disc, and now we have almost like a cancer that's grown here. And so the, the ectoderm cells are, by mitosis, they're dividing again and again and again, and they're helping to push I can't make, a, make them all push, but it's helping to bend this down. Picture the ectoderm going this way. It's going to pinch this together. We're eventually going to completely bypass this thing and reform the ectoderm. Okay, so that's going to get pushed down. All right, so ectoderm is helping, as I just said. Ectodermal cells are growing together, and that pushes down the neural fold. All right, just like that. 
nerve plays being forced downward by the ectoderm cells growing toward the midline. All right, so now some new triangular shaped cells are gonna pop up on the lateral folds. Now we're gonna bend it again. Uh, and the same shroom is involved in this. So somehow shroom starts kind of becoming a little more widespread and the cells all become, uh, but it starts in the lateral hinge, these lateral hinge points. Um, so why, how it, why those become sensitive and the other cells around it don't, we don't quite know that, but shroom is involved again. Matter of fact, let me, I should add shroom here again. That's 473. Um, yeah, but that's going to, let's take a look at the lateral. You'll see what I mean. Uh, and so here are lateral hinge points. So somehow shroom has bypassed all these cells for now and affected this region right here. Uh, so shroom is telling these guys to become triangular. Same thing here. And why that is, we still, that's still a mystery. But eventually all of these cells are going to become triangular, so shroom is going to kind of rule here and form this into a tube. Uh, but a distinct median hinge point occurs first, and then a lateral hinge point occurs. And then everything, so you can get a little one started right here. So shroom is going to make all of these triangle and make this thing. Plus with the, the um, ectoderm cells growing this way, it's going to pinch it. We should mention now we got something weird going on here. Uh, so this was the very kind of the lateral margins of the neural plate, uh, a region where no BMP is formed here. All of the BMP genes are turned off here. High BMP out here, right, super high. But right here, there's kind of a medium amount of BMP. And it does something weird, something magical. These cells become neural crust cells. And these neural crust cells make so much tissue from your body is derived from these neural crust cells. You're going to be amazed uh, at the list. You're not going to like the list because you have to know the list. Very high board yield stuff. Um, but those neural crust cells are pretty down important. So everything I just said, they start forming there at the uh, lateral parts of the neural plate. Extremely important, these neural crust cells. All right, so finally creation of the tube. We're going to close the tube up, and the neural crest cells are going to fly the coop. So about day 21, um, so what is that? That's the end of the third week, kind of getting ready to start the fourth week. Uh, the hinge points and more, I mean, more of these become triangular. It forms more of a tube. Uh, but And then the the ectoderm pushing in, the bottom line is we're going to fuse the most lateral margins of the neural plate to create a tube. It's very much tube shaped by this point. Um, somites, which we're not going to have time to talk about, I'm actually quite a ways behind as I develop this class that kind of cut off the end. Um, I do have YouTube videos of that though, so I encourage you to watch. watch. As I said, there's not nearly enough time to discuss embryology, but I do have YouTube videos. Probably next quarter I'll cut some of these lectures out and refer students back to the earlier ones so I can keep building this class. Um, but anyway, so somites are starting to form about this time, which are important. Um, so here's where we are. Uh, so the neural tube is folding up and these ends are, going, are being driven together. And the neural tube has been created here. It's completely fused together. But notice how the neural crest cells here, uh, they're about ready to fly the coop. And for a short time, they're going to be hanging out here uh, on the dorsal surface of this neural tube. So how are they going to fly the coop? Now remember, these are all uh, epithelial type cells. Even these uh, neural endocrine or these neural cells here, these neural um, ectoderm cells, they're still epidermal in nature, so they can't move. They have anchored, they have NCAD adherens anchoring them together. So how do you think we're going to get these guys to fly? Well, just like we, our epiblast cells kind of flew in to, to create the mesoderm, uh, same kind of deal. We have to convert them into mesenchymal cells, and that's exactly what's going to happen in this region. 
we're going to undergo a epithelial to mesenchymal transformation. And once they're mesenchyme, they have little arms. They can swim, and they swim out of there before the fusion occurs. All right? Uh, so the dorsalmost region, the neural, uh, the neural plate or neural folds fuse together. Uh, as that happens, the lateralmost region uh, undergoes a epithelial to mesenchymal transformation. They're now called neural crest cells, and they get the heck out of there so they don't get pinched in the uh, the process. The process of these cells flying the coop, that's got a word. That's called delamination, delamination. And our new neural crest cells, they typically hang out for a short time uh, right between the dorsal part of the neural tube and the ventral portion of the ectoderm is where they, in fact, they like to migrate there as well. Those are usually their migration paths. Right, kind of everything we said. Just the picture again. And yeah, there we go. There's the neural crest cells. Uh, very safe area for them. Um, they have to watch out for certain things. They can be destroyed or they can, uh, as they migrate, because these are great swimmers. They're going to swim many, many miles. Well, not miles, but they're going to swim a long distance, so they need to be protected. Okay, so neural crest cells have went through epithelial mesenchymal transformation, epithelial to mesenchymal transformation, through the process of delamination, um, i.e. they've migrated out of the uh, of the neural plate, the, the neural folds, before they've come together to form the neural tube. Uh, note how the neural ectoderm has formed a tube-like structure now. Note how the ectoderm has repopulated. See, there's no more hole here. Everybody's happy. It's fixed. So we basically swallowed uh, these original uh, ectoderm cells, converted them to neuroectoderm cells, rolled them up in a tube, and swallowed them. All right. Uh, some details of closure. The neural pores, as we said, the tube, these, this closure process is really happening in the middle of the tube. The middle of the tube is actually the cervical region. Uh, so that's the region that closes first, uh, and it's opened at the cranial and caudal ends. And uh, those are the neural pores. So the point where we're at now, where we just did this, this happened right in the middle uh, of the bilaminar disc. In a, and that region would be, I know it's not really in the middle in our bodies, but that's the cervical region in the, uh, the little human here. The ending, the open ends at the cranial end, because uh, the cranial neural pore, much larger. It's also called the anterior neural pore. Why anterior when it's cranial? Because it's going to bend. We have folding starting in week four now, so it's going to be bent under as well. Caudal neural pore, um, it's also called the posterior neural pore. All right, so there's where we are right now. But as week four goes on, and these somites start popping up, this thing's going to zip up like a zipper in both directions. Right? So the cranial neural pore closes first. So this one will close first. Even though the author drew this one as Looks like this one's about closed, but it doesn't. Cranial nerve, cranial neural pore closes about day 25. Caudal neural pore closes about day 28, about three days later. Um, at this point, we're about the end of week four when this tube is finally complete. So the process of neurulation really takes us through most of week three and all of week four. And the somites are coming all through week four. And folding is occurring all at the same time. We really have two more lectures before we even get the little human folded up. Which, again, I refer you to YouTube to watch and study on your own for boards. Um, let's see. What else do we need to say? Yeah, so this process of sealing this tube up is really important. If you don't seal the tube up, if you leave the tube like this, the spinal cord is going to form under here, and these are going to these somites are going to form vertebrae. There's going to form a vertebral canal. If it doesn't close, you don't have any any posterior or vertebral arch at all. So the roof of the vertebral canal is going to be gone, and that is a big problem. 
So some serious birth defects can occur. We're going to look at two of them real quickly. I'm not going to go crazy into them. Um, but let's talk about them. I should have warned you. Gross picture. I can't. Sorry. I can't see these coming ahead of time. When I'm in class, I can. Classroom. But I can't now. Um, so this obviously is a fetus that didn't make it. This had a severe neurological defect. There's no skull and there's no spinal, uh, there's no posterior vertebral arch, right? We can see that the kind of makeshift spinal cord is already forming here, but there's no vertebrae closing it over the back. So if the vertebrae, it's like a massive laminectomy, uh, a massive uh, spina bifida, right? There's no posterior arch here at all. Um, so that's called a rachisis. Rachiskisis, rachiskisis, rachiskisis. Uh, and that's when the spinal cord portion, the thin portion of the key, fails to completely close. So neural tube failure to close, called a rachiskisis. Uh, and then we have a craniosciskis, is when the skull fails to fuse, uh, and the skull is made from the cranial portion of the neural tube. So if this neural tube doesn't close up here, the skull can't form, and you have an exposed brain, and that's called a crane, crane like rain, crane e os, kiss kiss. Right? Two stars. I've used that on many a test or similar images to these. All right, let's take a look at crest cells, and then we'll call it a quarter. So. And let me see where I'm at, too. I'm a, oh, I'm okay. I got time. So we'll keep going here. Um, cranial, cranial crest cells are super, super. They're so important, these uh, neural crest cells. Neural crest cells are so important. They call them, some authors call them the fourth germ layer. They give rise to so much tissue. And you'll see what I mean here in a second. Um, they originate from cells located along the lateral margins of the neural plate. Right, they became came mesenchymal in nature uh, because of a medium level of BMP. Did I skip over that slide? I remember telling you, but I don't remember seeing the slide. Anyway, what induces neural crest cells to form? Oh, I haven't told you yet. We'll do it right here. Uh, so, bone morphogenetic uh, protein ex or uh, BMP BMP exposure. Remember, the ectoderm cells in the midline uh, were exposed to BMP inhibitors. Uh, the cord in the naga and the cerebrus one, they shut off BMP, and that caused the, the ectoderm cells to revert to their, their, their default state, which is a neural tissue. Uh, they're uh, called neuroectoderm cells. Ectoderm cells that don't secrete any BMP can't become neural crust cells. They become neuroectoderm cells. We know that. So medium levels of BMP is the secret. So ectoderm cells in the lateral regions, they express high levels of BMP. They can't become neural crest cells. And they can't become uh, neuroectoderm cells either. But the ectoderm cells that are just lateral to the neural plate, those are expressing medium levels of BMP. And that BMP is going to cause them to morph into neural crest cells. It's going to push those cells uh, through through epithelial to mesenchymal transformation so they can swim. Uh, so that's the secret, medium amounts of BMP expression. So what turns on BMP in these regions? Because it's turned off just medial to these. Uh, so this is complex, uh, and we don't fully know the story. Uh, but there there's some transcription factors that need to be uh, turned on. So there's this MSX, uh, DL, DLX5, and PAX need to be turned on. Uh, the transcription factors, these guys turn on other genes within the cells that are going to become neural crust cells, specifically this FOXD3, SOX10, ETS1. And these are the guys, if you're going to be a neural crust cell, you have to have these three germ, three germs, three genes turned on. Okay, we won't go any deeper than that. To have these turned on, you have to have these turned on. 
So pretty complex. I mean, this is, don't study this slide unless you're going for Val Victorian. I may throw a hard question there. I mean, uh, the nerd alerts, uh, those are, I mean, I still, I still test on them, but I don't test on them as much. Uh, Morsa's went and beta uh, keratin signaling activates the GBX2 homobox gene, which also is essential. Uh, so Carlson didn't mention that, but Moore talked about this uh, GBX2 homobox gene also needs to be turned on. So I guess we could add that to these three as well. How do neural crest cells break loose? Right. Uh, well, they have to break loose. They have to shed their ecadherins and ncadherins. And they, how do they do that? They get exposed to three gene products, which are kind of Cam Turner offers. We got our snail one and two, and twist is a new one, and fox D3. These are the ones that kind of make them become mesenchymal, and they break the bonds between them. Uh, so they have to be able to move around. We broke the bonds between them. Uh, they turn mesenchymal. I don't think we went into the bio, the molecular biology on that, which you'll be happy. Uh, but yeah, they go through epithelial to mesenchymal transformation. We kind of said that already. Now they're free to migrate. Um, I'm going to just say about that story, one gene that needs is worth mentioning. They're di when they migrate, they, they go long distances. They're vulnerable to damage and attack and breakdown. And they have kind of a protecting gene that is turned on in them. And that's the SOX10 gene. Right? So that's, uh, it protects them from getting stuck and prematurely turning it into something. Let's say uh, that one is destined to, uh, one is destined to become, um, oh, let's say, how about a melanocyte in your back of your hand. Uh, so that has to travel a long way to the limb buds, which are forming. And so you don't want that 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 swimmer to be stopped uh, and so it has a gene called SOC10 that protects it and tells it okay you don't stop you keep migrating forward because you have to go to the limb bud and you're going to go to the region that forms on the back of the hand you're going to be a melanocyte so it makes sure that it they kind of they kind of fulfill their destiny so to speak so it's an important gene that needs gene mutations. The, the fetus won't be viable if that gene is mutated. That's our current uh, understanding of this. All right, neural crest cell migration. Uh, and before they start moving, there's some other important genes that need to be turned on. I thought I said I wasn't going to hit you with these. I think I'll, I'll just give you the names of them, though. Uh, Roboslit. Uh, neurofillin, uh, this efferin, uh, Moore's adds a Fox D3, Snail 2, Sox X, Sox 9, and Sox 10. Uh, that's my maybe getting a little cuckoo though. Uh, which path do they go? So they tend to stay along the basal lamina, such as the surface underneath the ectoderm. Uh, derm, uh, the ba basal lamina is going to develop underneath the ectoderm cells, and they hang out there. They also hang out on the surface of the neurotube in that little space where they, where you just saw them for the first time. They have to watch out for tissues that contain uh, proteoglycans, like chondroitin sulfate, uh, because that will stop migration dead in its track. So they have to, they have to stay where no chondroitin sulfate is. So they have paths that they go down. And they stimulate, uh, and they, they travel, and they morph into, they're pure stem cells. They morph into an amazing amount of tissue. So you got to know this stuff. Let's see what they turn into. So the word, if you see the word ganglia in a question, what's the derivative of a sensory ganglia? Think neural crest cell, because many ganglia are controlled by these. So ganglia in the peripheral nerves, like our dorsal root ganglia, they're called sensory ganglia. The ganglia of cranial nerves, uh, 5, 7, 9, and 10, are all partially derived from neural crest cells. 
like the trigeminal ganglia. It's got so many AKAs, Gasserian ganglia, semilunar ganglia. It's got a ton of AKAs for it. Uh, Merkel cells are really important. We talk about that in dermatology, Merkel cell carcinoma. Ex one of the worst cancers in the world. It's extremely rare, though. Um, but, yeah, they differentiate into Merkel cells. Do you know what those are? So here's the... Here's the epidermis, the layers. These are stratum basale, spinosum, granulosum. Uh, the stratum corneum is up here at the top. Sometimes there's a stratum lucidum if you're in glabrous skin. Uh, but down at the bottom here, these are magic cells too. These cells, these are the basal cells. Uh, they split by mitosis to repopulate, to create a new basal cell, and they create a carotenocyte. And the carotenocytes in this region are stratum spinous, spiny cells, a whole bunch of AKAs for them. Uh, but as they get ratcheted up, they get as these divide again, they get pushed up and up and up and up and up. And granulocytes, they get flatter, and we'll do that in dermatology. You should, you should have done that in histology. But anyway, I digress. This is the thing we're looking at right here. So this is a Merkel disc. Uh, it's extremely sensitive. When you touch something very gently with your finger pads, there's a lot of these Merkel discs that detect pressure. Uh, and it's quite an amazing thing. Uh, it's made up of two parts, a Merkel cell, which has all the kind of uh, sensory apparatus on it. And then it's got uh, this portion right here. Uh, and it goes into a nerve Right here, this is kind of the a or alpha, uh, the a beta afferent nerve, is this part right here of the uh, Merkel disc. So Merkel cell, and then there's the nerve ending, and um, yeah, that's the mechanism there. So who do these come from? Who makes these? Yeah, neural crust cells make them. They make most of the parts of this nerve, not all the parts of the nerve, but they make that nerve as well. See, they're, they're crazy travelers. Uh, they make Schwann cells. We've got to talk about those a little bit. They're, that's the main glial cell of the PNS is a Schwann cell. kind of wraps axons to so the action potential can jump. Saltatory conduction, you should have had that in physiology. Uh, it makes the neural lemma, which is the kind of the plasma membrane around the Schwann cell. All right, definitely I asked this last time. You got to know this basic stuff here. Uh, so this is a, a peripheral nerve. Uh, remember, it has some layers. It has an epineurium on the outside, and then it's got these fascicles, these bundles inside the big nerve. Uh, and that is the kind of capsule around that is called the perineurium. So you got to know these until you get out of here. Then you probably will never use these words again. But until you get through boards, there's an epineurium, uh, there's a perineurium. And then here are the axons. The axons have another covering on them, and that's called the endoneurium. And on some peripheral nerves, if you remove the endoneurium, you'll see that the axon has a covering around it. And that's a Schwann cell that's wrapping around there like a spiral. And the Schwann cell's plasma membrane is called the neural lemma. Neural lemma. Or neural lemmal sheath. Or, yeah, or neural lemma. A.K.A. neural lemma, sheath of Schwann, plasma membrane. Uh, yeah, so I like this. Uh, so the Schwann cells are made... Um, by our little travelers, the neural crest cells. Uh, the neural lemma is also made by it as well. Here's the, here's the rub, though. Here's the tricky question. Surprisingly, the other coverings of this nerve, the epineurium, the perineurium, and the endoneurium, are not made from Schwann cells. They're made from mesoderm, right? So watch out for this one. It's a good question. Neuroquest cells, uh, they also make up a lot of the autonomic nervous system. So the entire sympathetic chain ganglia, there's that word ganglia again, ciliac ganglia made by neuroquest cells. Other parasympathetic ganglia, the ethmoid 
ganglia, sphenopalatine ganglia, submandibular ganglia, ciliary ganglia. That word ganglia will serve you well. Ganglia equals neural crest cell. Uh, the leptomeninges. What in the heck are the leptomeninges of the prosencephalon and the mesencephalon made from neural crest cells? What is the leptomeninges? That's a fancy way to say pia mater and arachnoid mater. Those two layers are pretty much stuck. There's a potential space between them, but they're pretty stuck together. So if you want to say pia mater and arachnoid mater with one word, you can say leptomeninges. Um, oh, but I'm sorry, the pia mater and the arachnoid mater are not stuck together. The dura mater and the arachnoid are stuck together. There's a space between pia and arachnoid mater, the subarachnoid space. Right, but the leptomeninges are those two. The dura mater is much tougher. That dura mater is not one of the leptomeninges. All right, um, melanocytes. Okay, uh, we use that in our example. I do I teach dermatology, so I do know my uh, melanocytic diseases. The adrenal medulla, carotid bodies. So what's that? I'll start you right now in dermatology first quarter. Uh, so if you ever see a lesion bigger than the number two pencil tip, that kind of breaks one of the rules of dermatology. Start raising eyebrows when when moles and things get that big. But if you ever see something like this that's variegated, this one's flat, but it has dark in it, has super light in it here. Uh, the borders are jagged. You can't fold it in half. That needs to go to dermatologist ASAP, especially if it's 8, 9, 10 millimeters. Um, this is malignant melanoma, and it is the leading cause of skin cancer death, and it is nasty. It metastasizes, killed Bob Marley. Uh, it metastasizes quick, and we'll talk all about that in dermatology. Actually, you can watch the whole dermatology class, can't you? It's on my little channel here. You can see all my classes. Uh, the skull, so some of the bones of the skull, uh, the squamous portion of the parietal bone and frontal bone, the maxilla and mandible are all made by neural crest cells. The bones of the nasal cavity, ethmoidal bones and lacrimal bones, made by neural crest cells. The auditory ossicles, those little tiny bones inside the ear, are made by neural crest cells. We should throw this on here. I used to have this in lab, but we didn't make it to this. I've introduced other pictures. Uh, but you need to know this. Next quarter, you need to know every nook and cranny. Uh, fast, the first three weeks are just memorizing these nooks and crannies. Go to my YouTube channel, and you will see I have, uh, I think, seven, eight videos covering every nook and cranny of the skull from the outside, underneath, pulled apart. I have a pull apart skull. So I think I got... 50,000 views on one of those things. Crazy. Maybe 70,000. It's become quite a popular. But get ready for gross, too, if you want to do something over the break. Start learning some of these new words. But for you guys right now, you probably know this, but I want you to know the basics. Uh, this is the frontal bone. In fact, this is the squamous portion of the frontal bone. Call it frontal bone. This is parietal bone. This is temporal bone. This is the mandible, which you know. This is the maxilla, everything in purple here. And what else? Nasal bone, zygomatic bone, also called the molar, M-A-L-A-R, molar bone. And that's all I want you to know for now. Right Here's the auditory ossicles of the inner ear, also derived from neural crust cells. We have the malocynchius and stapes. Uh, and so this is the, here he takes mechanical sound waves and transfers them deep into the ear. You'll learn that in physiology, but let's know the parts of it. Uh, so uh, this malleus, the handle of the malleus, looks like kind of a hammer. This is the, the kind of the head of the hammer. That's the, the handle of the hammer. Uh, and that hits the incus here. And then that moves the stapes, which looks like a stirrup kind of base of the stapes there. What else? Yeah, we're not done yet. Look at this huge one, the dermis, not the epidermis. What's the epidermis made from? Take a wild guess. 
ectodermics, the epidermis. But underneath that, the dermis and even the fat and the subcutaneous tissue is all made from fat cells, adipocytes, all made from neural crust cells. Cornea of the eye. Um, that one I would have thought, I mean, to me, it's an outer layer. It should be ectoderm, but it's not. It's made by neural crust cells as well. And then the stroma of glands, kind of the stuff that cells float in. Stroma of the thyroid, parathyroid, thymus, salivary, lacrimal glands, all made by neural crust cells. See why it's the fourth germ layer? Because it's so busy. Uh, the heart we could talk about. The valves, the semilunar valves, the aortic and pulmonic valves, those are the semilunar valves. Uh, the tunics of the aorta are all made from neural crust cells. The outflow tract, what's the outflow tract of the heart? That's the right and left ventricle, pulmonary trunk, and ascending aorta, all made from neural crust cells. Vascular smooth muscle, that's a huge one, right? Uh, all made from smooth muscle. So, sixty-four thousand dollar question: How do, how in the heck do they know what to become? How can this be possible? Uh, and we're not a hundred percent sure, but there's a couple of theories, just general theories. One theory says that neural crust cells have equal potential to become anything, and they migrate all over the body. And where they stop migrating, the chemicals, the proteins that are expressed in the environment they move into will tell them what to become. Another theory says that no, the neural crust cells right when they're born are pre-programmed to know what they're going to become uh, and they become that. They, they migrate to where they're supposed to be and they are predestined to become that. Many authors think it's a mix of these two theories. Uh, we kind of covered this, but let's do this one a little more because we didn't completely finish the neural tube because there is no neural tube all the way down in the sacral and coccygeal regions. Remember, we talked about this. Instead, we have to go through another process, which is called secondary neurulation, uh, to f in order to form uh, these structures. So let's talk about secondary neurulation. Uh, so that, remember the tail bud, uh, the primitive streak that was degener degenerating away, the very caudal portion of it gave rise to a structure called a tail bud. Uh, and that tail bud induces the sacrum coccygeal neur neural tube formation. The first thing that happens is you get this rod-like structure called the medullary cord. Medullary cord. And this is going on underneath the dorsal ectoderm of the tail bud. So mesenchymal cells migrate out of the tail bud and make this happen. So uh, there's the tail bud we talked about. That's the end of the primitive streak. Some magic happens here. And cells migrate out of this and form this medullary cord. We're going to connect the medullary cord to our neural tube to finish the job of neurulation. So as soon as that tube is formed, the center becomes hollow. It cavitates out. Uh, so now the central cavity, as it's called, uh, develops a central canal, and that connects to the real neural tube. And uh, yeah, that once that connects, the process is over. Uh, so here's a cavitation has occurred to form a central cavity, and it connects up right to here and it joins up and there we have our sacrum coccygeal neural tube has joined the real neural tube that we just created. So a little bit of weirdness down there. Okay, so what happens next? We form the neural tube, uh, but remember it's forming like a zipper, so we gotta finish the job, close those neural, uh, the last job of forming the neural tube is to close up uh, those tubes. And that is the process of secondary neurulation was done. Uh, the next thing happens, the cranial portion undergoes a series of divisions too. So once the tube is all closed up and neurulation is over, all sorts of crazy stuff happens. We're just going to take a little glimpse at what's going on in the cranial portion of the neural tube. It's already forming the brain by the time these neural tubes close. It's actually 
during the process, it's already forming these primary vesicles. But let's take a look at these. So now look what our neurotube, this is the fat part of the neural plate. Look what's happened. We formed the primitive brain with a prosencephalon, a mesencephalon, and rhombencephalon here. Uh, and that's the cranial portion of the neurotube. So pretty cool. Prosencephalon becomes the forebrain. Mesencephalon is the midbrain that we have right now. And the hindbrain, the rhombencephalon, is the hindbrain. If you want to go a little further, we can go further. You're going to have to know all this for neuroscience anyway, so you might as well memorize it now. We won't talk about its parts or anything, but uh, if we go... Uh, another few weeks of development. Now we've got even a better looking brain. Prosencephalon has split into a diencephalon and telencephalon. Right? Diencephalon is, contains the thalamus and hypothalamus, which is super important regions. We'll talk about that in uh, endocrinology. Uh, the mesencephalon doesn't subcategorize at all. It just hangs out. But the rhombencephalon splits into a a uh, metencephalon, a malencephalon. Um, so this splits into regions. Um, this will become the medulla oblongata and will connect to the spinal cord and the foramen magnum. And yeah, there's our little human with a little brain. So it doesn't even have arms. It's got some little arm buds and, and leg buds sticking out. But it's already got kind of a three-piece brain. Uh, really, each one of those pieces is already subcategorizing. So pretty amazing. Uh, did you notice the folding? That would be coming, I think we're actually two lectures lacking, but luckily I do have both of those on YouTube so you can watch those. Uh, so yeah, the little the little guy is folding. Week four is also the week of somites and folding. All right, so we'll get to that soon. So I'm gonna stop it right there. I think that's enough for your your brains. Uh, and you can pick up and watch video number seven and number eight on you. I'm not going to test you over that, but you should go through that because that's really important in embryology as well. And uh, yeah, it's been a, a strange quarter, hasn't it? It's like I heard, I didn't get to know you guys at all. Usually I know you well by this point, but uh, I will see you in fifth quarter a lot. Uh, so have a great break. Um, I guess I better not say goodbye yet. But I guess I better because it's probably the last time I'll talk to you. Uh, have a great break, and we'll see you next quarter. I won't see you. I don't teach anything in second quarter. I won't see you till fifth quarter, but have a good, safe break. And study hard for this embryology test, right? Some of you guys didn't do the greatest. Uh, make sure you have your notes well organized. I give you plenty of time, and you should be able to double-check double all the questions. I want you to memorize this stuff because you're going to have boards in 6th quarter-ish, 7th quarter-ish. So if you memorize it now, it won't be as painful trying to study the stuff in 6th or 7th quarter. Your job in 6th and 7th quarter is to bring stuff back that you've already memorized and you've kind of forgot it, and it's easier to bring it back. If you've never got it into deep memory, you're going to have trouble. So try to get this into deep memory. All right, see you guys later.